I'm Michael Schutzen. I teach at Columbia Journalism School. I'm a professor there in the PhD program and the master's programs, and I'm a historian in sociology of American politics and media. Uh, and I've just published a book called The Rise of the Right to Know, Politics and the Culture of Transparency, 1945 to 1975. The concept of right to know since it came to be part of our language in the 50s and 60s uh, has transformed a great deal in American society with respect to government, where the term is used most frequently. Uh, it has made government information more accessible to the, the press, more accessible to the public, and I should add, it, it makes executive government uh, information more accessible to the Congress itself. Much more broadly, it changed how people think about their lives in America. Uh, it's changed how doctors um, talk to or don't talk to their patients. It was common practice uh, with, with a patient who had a serious, probably fatal illness for the doctor not to tell them that. Um, and there's stunning um, evidence of this in uh, some surveys done, and one in 1961 that found that 12% of doctors treating cancer patients mentioned to the patient that they had cancer. Um, by 1979, the survey was repeated, and it was 98% of doctors. And th this, this changed aspects of medical research, where subjects of, uh, of medical research uh, had to be informed, informed consent um, to participate in the, the research, especially if there was something that might damage them or, or uh, affect their health adversely. Um, campaign finance disclosure came in in the 1970s, um, and, and people would share much more than they had before about again, aspects of their own lives that had been private. When Betty Ford uh, was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer in 1974, she spoke about that publicly, and she spoke about um, uh, her mastectomy publicly. And this was shocking to people in 1974, but, um, uh, but she became something of a national heroine as a result. Uh, the, the right to know is, is a not technically a legal right. Um, that is, it's not protected by the Constitution. It is, in some specific instances, it's protected by legislation. So if you want information from the government and you file a Freedom of Information Act request because it's not, you can't find it on the department's website or anywhere else uh, and phone calls don't work, so you file a FOIA, as it's called, request and uh, the government is obliged by law to respond to you within so many days. If they respond and they say, we're not going to share that information because it, they have to specify it falls under exemption so-and-so, um, you can say, well, so they tell me, but they're wrong. Um, and I'm going to sue for this information. And then you can take them to court under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and you may win and you may lose, but um, more than a few times, you will win. Looking ahead with the internet, can we imagine a case where uh, we're going to cut back on all this information sharing? Can we, can we put the genie back in the bottle? Um, n not entirely. Uh, no, I don't think we can. And we have to learn to adapt to um, a a wildly new environment. Um, there are a lot of these dilemmas that um, are going to keep arising in, in, as we take it for granted that information is supposed to be public. As a first principle, I think, yes, um, public information should be public. Um, but in practice, it gets vastly more complicated than that.